a mile in 20 seconds. What's it like? It's fast, close, tight. Great racing, lots of passing. Anything can happen. It's really tough. Very treacherous. And we call in the business a bull ring. And down below, there it is, the ring. New Hampshire International. And we're here in Loudoun, New Hampshire for the New England 200, the last oval of this 1995 PPG and E-Car World Series season. Hello and welcome. I'm Paul Page. This is the day that could begin to determine the championship. It is the first opportunity that Canadian Jack Villeneuve may actually score his championship so long awaited. In the points right now, he obviously is well ahead. If he can leave this race with a 45-point difference over any competitor, he leaves this race as the champion. But can he do it? Is it really that easy? Not here at Loudoun, because things happen fast, they happen quick, and anything can happen. Take the start just last year, as they came down for the green flag. Everybody went everywhere, but most notably, Jack Veneuve ended up against the wall, and it was a pointless day for him. And today, he starts in 15th position. That's the worst start that he has ever had in his IndyCar career. So for him, today may be an uphill battle. But there are some great stories here today, too. Let's go trackside and Gary Gerald. Paul, no question, we've got the ingredients for another absolute whirlwind on this bullring when you consider only one second separates the top 20. And who's on the pole? How about the rookie from Brazil, Andre Ribeiro, the ninth different pole winner this year, the second rookie to do it, Honda-powered Firestone tires. He was sensational at nearly 178 miles per hour, looked like he had it locked up, and then all of a sudden, late in the session, there came the veteran from Italy, his name, Teo Fabi. He came within three hundredths of a a second as he put his Ford Cosworth Power Goodyear tire machine right here alongside on the front row. Tremendous speed on one lap. Now they've got to do it for 200 laps with 24 challengers right behind them. So you got the youngster from Brazil up front, you got the veteran from Italy alongside. Where are the Americans, you're saying? Right behind us in row two, and Jan Bikas is there. That's right, Gary. On row number two, we have two of the hardest charging drivers here on the circuit, both Americans, however, with different engine, tire, and chassis specifications. First of all, Scott Pruitt, of course, Firestone tires, Lola chassis, Ford power. We know how much he loves the ovals after winning the Michigan 500. Now, right next door, the ultra-aggressive Robbie Gordon with a different package. Again, Goodyear tires, Raynard chassis, and a Ford power plant. Now, we know Robbie Gordon loves to go to the outside here on a one-mile oval. You think maybe in turn number one he might think about going to the outside of Teo Fabi? We're only moments, Paul, from finding out. And then there's the ovals themselves. Derek Daly, when drivers first come to an oval, they're scared to death. And then they decide that they really like them. And you know, the strange thing is, no matter how many times you come to the same oval, they continue to be scary because of the sheer speed you have to run between these concrete walls and be mistake-free. But if you get a car to handle well, you will not have a better afternoon's racing than on a one-mile oval. And to win, the key is aggression? Oh, aggression is rewarded here so much because these corners are relatively tight for an oval, which means the driver can contribute greatly by hustling the car. But aggressive moves, inside or outside, can make huge difference is here as we saw in 93 in that titanic battle with Mansell and Tracy. Now when we're talking aggression though that's something normally in a veteran. Our pole sitter Andre Ribeiro his first ever pole. And the veterans you mentioned let's just pick two Michael Andretti and Paul Tracy they're well back down on the grid but they are so good in aggressive racing situations during the race but Ribeiro now no matter how much talent he has let's face it we cannot expect him to have the confidence or the experience or the aggression level to run in traffic as well as these veterans. So I believe he will get a lesson in race track management this afternoon. All right, well, the command to start engines has just rung out. Andre Ribeiro sits there on the pole, Teo Fabi to your left. As the balloons fly, and when we come back, we'll be ready to race. Well, the cars are rolling now, and as already suggested, it's a very interesting lineup for the New England 200 on the pole. Andre Ribeiro, his first ever pole, comes with a brand new track record. Teo Fabi will be alongside. This is his third front row start of the year. In the second row, Scott Pruitt, and it equals his best ever for the Michigan 500 winner. 
And outside, it'll be Robbie Gordon. He won easily this season on the one-mile oval at Phoenix. In row three, Christian Fittipaldi has four top ten finishes in five oval races this year. And Jimmy Vassar, he's finished in the top ten in both of his previous Loudon starts. The fourth row, Mauricio Guzman. One of only two drivers to be running at the finish at every oval race this season. And Jill DeFerrin, his best finish came on the oval at Milwaukee. In row five, Michael Andretti. The Toronto winner has a second and a fifth in his two previous starts here. And Adrian Fernandez, he's finished every race since Indy, and all of them in the points. In row six, it's Brian Herta and Juan Manuel Fangio. In row seven, Raul Boisel, who is starting in his spare car after a crash in the morning warm-up. And Paul Tracy. And Jack Villeneuve in row eight. Only one of his five career wins have come on an oval. And Emerson Fittipaldi will be alongside. Row nine, Al Anser Jr. and Eddie Cheever. The tenth row, Alessandro Zampedri. And Bobby Rahal, the winner of the first IndyCar race here. Row 11, Marco Greco and Carlos Guerrero. The twelfth row, Buddy Lazier and Stefan Johansson. In row 13, Eliseo Salazar and Hiro Matsushita, who starts last because he was underweight and his qualifying time was disallowed. And here today, 200 laps with the fuel windows starting about lap 62, extending through 69. And take a look at that one fact. The top 20 are separated by less than a second. There is the breakdown in today's field, chassis and engine. So we're ready to go. Honorary starter here today, somewhat hidden at the moment, but it's Richard Luger, the senior senator of Indiana, who was mayor of Indianapolis for many years and certainly knows and understands and loves his IndyCar racing. And we saw the accident last year. One of the problems here in New Hampshire is cold tires. These cars have 800 horsepower that tends to break away these rear tires. Bozell crashed this morning, and Johansson crashed in practice on cold tires. So what's the start? Already the PPG pace car cycles off on the back side of the circuit. This is turn three as Andre Ribeiro, the rookie pole sitter and track record holder now, brings the field through the third turn into turn four, begins to pick up the pace, watching for that green, and here we go. Dale Fabi immediately jumps into the front. Robbie Gordon coming up to challenge on the outside. Fields safely through one and two, screaming down the back stretch. It's Teo Fabi, and we've got an accident coming off of two. Accident off of two. Fernandez. Fernandez was the guy involved last year as well. Car badly damaged on the left side. This is Adrian's second big crash of the weekend here. On Friday, he was the second fastest car in practice, and he had a very, very big crash coming off turn four. So we mentioned it not 15 seconds earlier. Cold tires on the first lap of these races. These cars are very difficult to handle. You can actually listen as the safety crew asks, is he all right? Apparently a nod to the affirmative. When you hit these concrete walls this hard, sometimes the driver gets dazed. He is quite happy to sit there. He's quite happy to sit there and wait for these experienced safety crews to get to him. Well, Pierzee's all right as he starts to climb out of the car. There's Rick Gallus, the car owner, and the remainder of the crew as they take a look to see what happened. Adrian's okay and walks away. Derek, here's the way it's set up. Coming off turn two, you can see he loses it by himself. And once you get away, once the car gets away from you here, it's a one-way ticket to the hard, unforgiving concrete wall. And although that car may not look destroyed, it is very, very heavily damaged. You see him down on the inside, bottom of the picture. We can take a look from our in-car camera. We've been over his shoulder all weekend here. Here's turn one. Just snapped around quickly on him. You could see he made around turn one. Then the uh, these are tight corners here. But he makes around turn one, gets wide. The back gets away from him all by himself. And when that happens, 
these concrete walls do an awful lot of damage to these Indy cars. Well, about seven very lucky drivers right behind him. Look right in the middle of the frame there as he loses the back end and takes a, a very hard hit with the wall. His second of the weekend and this morning warm up. That's where Bussell got into the wall as well. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Rick Ellis has been a very, very difficult weekend, and it really puts a damper on what had been a terrific second half of the season for this team. Yeah, Gary, we're, we're just unfortunate things like this happen. Uh, you know, Adrian did a great job all weekend, even though he had that problem. The car was fast, and uh, we felt like we had a good race going today, but unfortunately it didn't work out. And uh, You know, one thing, when we hit the fence, we hit it together, and when we win, we win together. So this isn't an Adrian's fault or the team's fault or anything. It's just something that happened. We just have to live with it. Thank you, Rick. All right, so a lot of debris to clean up on the track right now, and that gives us an opportunity to take a break as well, catch our breath, as the New England 200 is yellow right after turn number two. Auto oil on the ground, so when he exits the pit during the pit stop, he's so the conversation with Robbie Gordon as you ride on board, we're at the New England 200 in Loudon, New Hampshire. Teo Fabi jumped the start, then got a good jump on Ribeiro, as did Robbie Gordon. But what about Robbie Gordon? We've watched him all season long. He's young, brash, and he hates to lose. I used to ride motorcycles every day after school, and I had one teacher that wrote home to my parents and said, um, you know, Robbie's not concentrating on school. All he wants to do is race. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the bad boy out there, but I, you know, I'm just definitely not going to be one of those drivers you can take advantage of and walk all over out there. I like to win races just as much as the next guy, and, and whatever it takes to win races, we'll do. I'm comfortable when I'm doing those kind of things, but um, you know, I, I think I react better under pressure. If you can't run with the big dogs, go home. <laughs> I tell you, he's fresh, but he is a good guy and fun to be around. Robbie Gordon, watch for him. I wonder what he's going to get, an, another off-road championship first or an IndyCar championship? Both are very likely. This is Adrian Fernandez, only his third DNF of the season. He DNF'd at Australia and at Indianapolis, but this was Friday here, Derek. On the other end of the racetrack. Now watch the black patch. He drives onto it right there, then he gets in trouble. Watch this. Now watch the flame. Gearbox smashes into the back of the wall. That was Friday. And then, of course, at the opposite end of the racetrack, on lap one, it all went wrong again. This is into turn one. Makes it safely through. Now he gets in trouble. Listen. He had a headache on Friday night, and he may have another one now. And Rick Gallus may have a headache when he writes the check to Rick Gallus two has a heartache right now. So they've gotten the car off the track. They still have quite a bit of debris, and they're a little bit concerned about oil that may be laid down there in the first and second turn. We'll be back. Andre Ribeiro, they'll be back single file, and so we'll have a little smoother run into the start. But it was interesting what Andre Ribeiro did. He really probably should have done almost the opposite. Exactly. He accelerated down through turns three and four, realized he was a long way ahead, backed off, Right at the time Fabi put his foot down, and of course Fabi got the slingshot. It looked good to the starter stand here, but of course Fabi had such a head of steam, he lost that place too, his, off, his uh, outside front row starter. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. And if you're wondering how the rookie Ribeiro is handling the early pressure and the anxiety from starting for the pole for the first time, only one radio conversation that we've monitored coming back to the team, Steve Horn and company, he was simply saying the car at the moment is a little loose. It's got an understeer problem, but they think that as they get the tires to temperature and the pressure build up under green flag conditions, that uh, that will all stabilize. He seems to be as cool as can be at this point. Let's go to Jan Bikas. 
And Gary, you ever wonder why during these pace laps the cars are weaving back and forth vigorously? The reason is they're trying to get what's called pickup off the tires. This is the other rubber from that's come off other tires that deposits here on the tires. These are Scott Pruitt's tires. Now look at these. These have no pickup on them whatsoever because they're so concerned about it. They take a heat gun here, apply the heat to the tire, and then pick up here a putty knife, and a mechanic has to actually individually scrub all that pickup off each and individual tire on these. Now, the drivers do it manually out there on the racetrack, but these guys all feel the pickup will be important today. And we should see a green flag the next time they come by. Robbie Gordon obviously moved early to get into this third position and is charging for the front. And that's really going to be important in the points fight because the further up he can get, the better off he's going to be, especially if Jack Villeneuve can stay back. And just in that one move, Gordon actually, for the moment, moved into second place in the points battle. It'll be one more lap now until the green flag as we take a look at the running order, of course, under yellow at the conclusion of lap eight. And don't take your eyes off Robbie Gordon because nobody likes to run on the outside line on that bravery line as much as Robbie Gordon. And he would try and pull one over Teo Fabi knowing that Ribeiro probably will not make a challenge for that lead position or that second position. Also, though, to take nothing away from Jack Villeneuve, he moved up two positions on the start ahead of Raul Boisel and Emerson Fittipaldi. Pace comes back up. Teo Fabi brings him to the green. Veteran guy on the pole, veteran racer in the Indy cars. And we're back green once again. There's Robbie, comes up as close as he can on the start, now closes on Bobby. The two pull away from third place, Ribeiro. And you saw Gordon high on that outside line, but Bobby was very quick on the line he chose. Here's Gordon's favorite move here. Can he make it? No, too far behind. comes in to make a move down underside Christian Fittipaldi. Oh, that was an aggressive move, an unusual move. He almost had to avoid Christian Fittipaldi, who lost so much time himself, and Michael now challenges him down the inside. Michael Andretti has Christian Fittipaldi on the inside, going into three. Now, Michael chasing DeFerrin. The battle for sixth place. They use the brakes here. They ride the brakes and get back on as soon as you can. Let's do it again as soon as he comes off. Ride the brakes a little bit, set the man up, get over the new patch of ground, and then get on the power. You mentioned it starting, Derek. Guys like Michael and his teammate Paul Tracy. Michael started ninth, is now seventh. Tracy started 14th, is now ninth. This is a period where things settle down. The real racing starts when you begin to encounter traffic. And on a one-mile oval, it doesn't take long for the leading cars to get into traffic. And then you see the aggressive moves and the experienced people begin to come up towards the front. Christian Fittipaldi is lined up just behind this man, Michael Andretti. Gary Gerald, you've been watching their team. Checking with the crew for Christian Fittipaldi, making sure that there wasn't something really ill handling. They say, no, it's just a case of a rookie driver here in this very busy mile oval settling in, getting into a race rhythm. Also, a radio report that we picked up, heavy bottoming from one of the observers reported on the number one car. That's Al Unser Jr. Remember the last time we had reports of heavy bottoming in Portland and what transpired? It's still a matter of fact, it's an appeal. And by the way, for those of you that may wonder, it is in the appeal process now. There'll be three judges appointed to hear that, uh, that issue over the run at Portland that eventually got Jimmy Vassar the win awarded to him. But our calculation of the points where we suggested it starting that Jack Villeneuve, as we watch him here, has to leave this track 45 points ahead of everybody else in order to be the champion here. That does take into account that hearing going either way. Good pictures of Jacques here. He had hoped to get into the top 10 as soon as possible. Tony Sicaly, his engineer last night, made a lot of changes on this car. Villeneuve believes that on full tanks, which he ran this morning, full, full every time he ran, he thought he was equal to Robbie Gordon. So now he chases Brian Herta. 
who has actually been in his own bit of a struggle this weekend. Not quite the match of Jimmy Vassar, except for one session on Saturday. And Jack, as we look back from Brian Herta's car, sits in a one-point position. He is 12. Brian Herta is in 11th. Dale Fabi still the leader. Gordon second and River Barrel third. Then Scott Pruitt and Jimmy Vassar. Let's go to Jan Bikas. Paul, in regards to Jack Villeneuve, he is receiving radio communications at the moment from Barry Green, his team owner, not on how close he is to the other competitors, but where the leader is. They're very concerned about keeping the leader in sight, making sure they don't go a lap down. Of course, there's something that happens so very quick on a one-mile oval. It's the front of the field already overhauling the back end of the field. Despite the fact that they were so very close in qualifying, a second covering the first 20 positions here. So Jack does his bit in the cockpit, and Barry Green does his bit on monitoring what happens in the race. What a team this has turned out to be, Paul. I mean, a team makes a driver, and a driver makes a team. But they are an example of a team who have spent their budget very wisely and had so much success on basically having harmony and the right people in the right place. One man has struggled throughout this weekend has been Stefan Johansson. Gary Gerald, those struggles continue? Apparently that's the case, Paul. We understand that uh, they, we know that they had to make a motor change after the warm-up session this morning. They only got a couple of laps in, and apparently they developed some kind of an oil leak. We anticipate that Tony Bettenhausen is going to bring him in. They may just park it for the day. Jack going into turn three, tries to make the inside move on Brian Herta but fails to make the pass. The question would be, where does Jack have to play this whole thing? He's got three races counting this one left. Go for broke here or just take it easy? Absolutely not, but here he is. A run on Brian Herter right here. Can he duck down the inside of turn three? Yes, he does. Under break, he makes it stick. Now he's only one place away from that top ten that he wanted to be in before his first pit stop. But I think some indication that he has been very careful. Let's go back up to the front of the field. Teo Fabi, number 33, as we watch Robbie Gordon and Andre Ribeiro. This is a battle for second place right behind the leader. Ribeiro now beginning to get up a full head of steam, and he moves inside of Gordon. So Ribeiro to second place, but look at Gordon. He comes right back. As the race settles down here, 25 laps gone, Ribeiro begins to find his feet. He ran down Robbie Gordon, and here's Scott Pruitt down the inside of Gordon. Pruitt in fourth place moves into the battle. Tries to get underneath Gordon. Look to the left there. That's Ribeiro just ahead. That was Derek Walker saying, watch Pruitt. Oh, he goes outside him and pulls it off. Ribeiro gets caught up with slower traffic. That's... Ribeiro got caught up with Salazar and had to drop back in behind Robbie. But look at Scott Pruitt as he works way high on the outside. And Ribeiro comes to the inside again, and he's got him. Now this is what's so great about the magic mile here in New Hampshire. As soon as you get into traffic, you have to begin to anticipate so far ahead. And that's why you see so many place changes like Robbie Gordon here and Andre Ribeiro. Salazar, the green and white car on the inside, becoming a factor in this. But now he realizes these are the leaders stringing past. And as both Pruitt and Vassar and DeFerrin come past. They tend to talk to one another as we watch Scott Pruitt move to the inside of Gordon again. Slower traffic, a factor. Drag racing down the back stretch. Pruitt gets in low. Gordon up on that high line that he loves. Whoa, he takes the bravery line and they stay side by side over to the front stretch. You have to hold your breath. You have to hold your breath when you move, make moves like this, but wheel to wheel at 190 miles an hour down this front straight, you also have to have confidence in the man that you're racing at that speed. Paul Pruitt seems to be better on the tight line down the inside. There he goes again. Boy, two cars each seem to be matched for the line that they're driving, which means when they get back to the start-finish line, they're dead even again. Remember what Scott Pruitt said at starting about these bull rings, and remember what Derek Daly said about how they can be terrifying and fun. 10-4, hang in there, you're doing good. Derek Walker, the car owner, talking to Robbie Gordon as we look back to the front of the field again. Andre Ribeiro beginning to close and trying to challenge Matteo Fabi. 
Again, slower traffic a factor. That's Carlos Guerrero just ahead. Kale holds the top position. Guerrero comes down under her to look at Rivero as he comes to the inside. Tighten your seat belts here, boys. This is some of the best. Rivero went down the inside of turn one and got blocked. Had to back out of it. But this is as good as it gets as Brian Hurt is in trouble. Brian Hurt is very definitely slowing as his teammate Jimmy Vassar comes around. He's on his way to the pits. You don't run that slow without having a major problem. But Rivero having a superb run here for Tasman. Hurt has dropped from 11th to 20th and, of course, just went a lap down. Back at the lead. There's Teo. And Rivero now beginning to roll up on him again. Lap or two, he should be right there. So Teo Foppy, the leader here, Andre Rivero in second, Pruitt third, then Vassar, then DeFerrin. Michael Andretti is now up to sixth. At the New England 200, you're riding with Robbie Gordon, but when you take a look at the top six, you can see that Robbie Gordon is in trouble. He's been falling steadily backwards. Gary Gerald, any idea what the problem is? Yeah, Derek Walker just indicated the car is extremely loose, and so that's what they're battling. They're hoping he can hang on until they get in the pit window for the first stop to make an adjustment. Same problem for Brian Herta. Paul Tracy, however, looks like a guy on the move, and he is really coming up through traffic. Now, with that yellow that we had in the first lap incident, I think we will not see pit stops if we stay green until the early 70 lap mark, maybe 72 to 75. Paul Tracy has moved up into seventh position just behind his teammate as we watch him here, Michael Andretti. Little explanation of, of the pit window, the way we refer to it. At starting, we said lap 62 would be the pit window. That's in a perfect situation. A team can also figure the pit window from the finish backwards as well. And we've heard Derek Walker talking about maybe about lap 39 they might pit this car. And the only reason Derek Walker would call him in earlier if he loses so much time on the racetrack with a handling problem, he could take him in, try and fix it, and then send him back up. Whoa. And look what's going on here. Three wide into one as here is Michael caught up with a whole gaggle of traffic in front of him as he comes down inside of Jimmy Vassar, picks him off for fourth place. And that's the use of traffic right there. Now he tries to go inside Pruitt. Look at that. Oh, Pruitt loses it. And Pruitt catches the wall. He loses it just in front of Michael. Little oil fire at the back of the car. Talk about okay. being right there. I see you. you all right? Got hit up pretty good. Looks like I got hit from behind or something. Talk about hey. being right there. I see you. you all right? Got hit up pretty good. Looks like I got hit from behind or something. Well, of course, we know different than that, as you saw it right from Michael's onboard camera. Scott Pruitt talking to Jim McGee, his team manager, and the IndyCar safety team right there. Fire has burned itself out at the back of the car, and that eliminates Pruitt from the championship. So now we're seeing some pit stops. Jan Bikas? Yes, Tail Bobby, our leader, brings in. He had just called in on the radio saying that he was one of those cars that was going very loose. So they have told him to take the front sway bar and make it full stiff. Now they're going to try and make an adjustment. Oh, they have a problem with the right rear. They have a problem with the gun. Tail Bobby in big trouble here. He's going to lose the lead for sure. They still can't get it tightened. Now Tail Bobby is down. A long stop for Tail Bobby today. Andre Rivero was rolling, but Michael Andretti, it looks, may have been the first out. Yeah, Michael Andretti got out ahead of everybody. So a round of stops under the second yellow of the day, bringing most of the field in, causing grief for Teo Fabi because of the problem with the air gun, and gives Michael Andretti the lead of the race. Let's go back. Scott Pruitt, they say, is okay. Here's what happened. Michael tries to go down the inside. Doesn't quite make it. Pruitt's now in the area where Fernandez crashed. All by himself, he loses control. From then on, just like Fernandez. On Friday. On Friday, one-way ticket to the concrete wall. Now, we, we are aware there's a little bit of a ripple in the pavement right about there. Here's the move from the in-car with Michael. He gets a good run on turn two. Passes Vassar, passes Bozell, tries to get by Pruitt. Can't do it. Pruitt gets brave. Watch this. See Michael on the brakes. Michael got on the brakes to make sure he didn't get, get gathered up by Pruitt. So Pruitt, despite thinking he may have got tapped from the back, this was a 
loose oversteering car. It happened all by himself. And we know that Gordon is complaining about being loose, as is Brian Herta. So Scott Pruitt, the report is he's okay. You see him walking back with Dr. Terry Trammell, one of the IndyCar physicians. We're under our second yellow of the day, and we'll be back right after this mentioned a short time before the yellow came out in the incident involving Pruitt that Tracy was a man on the move and then suddenly he was having a major problem with the car. He came in under the benefit of the yellow and underneath Steve that wrap right down there is a right front tire that was badly worn. That was greatly contributing to the ill handling. The Goodyear engineers have already taken a preliminary look at it. They'll say they'll try to determine of course with further testing and observation just what may have caused the problem. Don't know if it was a lock brake. Don't know if it was a tire pressure problem or what. But that was dramatically influencing the handling for Tracy. So this yellow was fortuitous for him. Meanwhile, while Teo Pavley was having his problems in the pit, Andre Ribeiro came in, got routine service. He gained that position back from Teo as he easily slid back on the circuit. Michael Andretti, however, yet to come in and make the stop, Paul. One guy definitely on the move. Al Unser Jr. has moved from 17th to 6th. And there is the serial scoring on little Al's car as he comes around under the yellow, second yellow of the day. We are scoring on the 47th lap. The Bud One airship bringing us today's aerial shots. It's up a thousand feet over this bull ring here. 194 feet long. Gives us some great aerials and has helped us analyze both of the accidents we've seen thus far. Football can be exciting. Should be going back to green flag shortly here. And here's some very interesting information. The pit stop summary. There's Michael. He came in in fourth, out in first. Paul Tracy in in sixth, out in second. The real loser in the whole thing seemed to be Teo Fabi, who went in in first and came out in eighth. So we'll keep an eye on him in eighth position and see if he's able to move up through the field because he certainly is fast on the track, but the pits failed him on that one. And take a bow, everybody in the Newman Haas team who goes over the wall to serve as Michael's car and Paul Tracy because that was a good example of the driver needing all the help he can get on a one-mile oval. And when he comes down the pit lane and makes that amount of place improvements, you have to say that the team is working extremely well. And, and as an update, the Newman Haas stops both Michael and Paul Tracy. We're going to split them up and watch on boards. We're routine stops for them. The interesting thing now is we have two of the most aggressive drivers on one mile ovals. Michael leading Tracy who loves to make that outside move and of course they just got one finger next time by they will get one finger and it's all all action again. Michael Andretti Paul Tracy nose to tail. That's the split screen you're looking at. Andretti in front, Tracy in second, then Jimmy Vassar, Ribeiro, Christian Fittipaldi, and Alan Sir Jr. up in sixth place is coming up through the field. By the way, two of the teams at least, Penske Racing and Newman Haas, sent spotters up to the press level to a grandstand normally used up here uh, by NASCAR, for example, to spot. And there was an official decision that they can't view from up there, they can view from grandstand. We've run into that before. Uh, at Milwaukee and a couple of other places. They were up there. They said, no, but you can move down to a grandstand. And they were concerned, uh, quite concerned about the safety issue. And safety, certainly, we've seen it as a problem on this track. Here we go. We're ready to run back to green. Lap 51, one-fourth of the race already done. Watch Paul Tracy trying to pull a move. But Ribeiro tries to block Christian Fittipaldi. Ribeiro, I think, having a good race here. Staying on the lead lap, keeping his nose clean and learning a lot. Fellow Brazilians, Ribeiro, Fittipaldi, battle for fourth. Nothing changes at the front. There comes Tail Fabi pass, just ahead of Robbie Gordon. So he's moved around one car, and that's Gordon Tail. Very definitely moving up through this field now. Bobby did such a great job all season long with this Jerry Forsyth entry. Virtually no damage in testing or in racing for the whole season. A little bit at Portland, but Gordon is in trouble again. Gilles DeFerrin goes down the inside. Whatever they were working on doesn't look like it worked. DeFerrin got around him. Now Jacques Villeneuve closes up behind Gordon. Gordon is ninth. Back to the front. Michael Andretti closing on Bobby Rahal. in 
15th place. Of course, he is the end of the lead lap. Down and under. There's the view from Ray Hall's car. Paul Tracy should be next coming up to the left there. So Ray Hall has struggled all week here. He's just not fast enough to stay on the pace. Now he's one lap down. Michael has a little bit of breathing space because Jimmy Vassar is on the charge and trying to run down Michael Andretti. All points contenders. There is Vassar coming out of the corner of the screen. And Ribeiro comes to the inside as Paul Tracy closes the door on him and they close down on Vassar. Well, Paul Ribeiro seems to be good. Here's the Honda power. Look at this. Ford versus Honda down the inside. This Firestar car is very good. We saw a pro pull it off earlier and yes, he does it. Oh, is that great. So Ribeiro moves up one on Paul Tracy. The order is Michael Vassar Tracy, Michael Vassar Ribeiro now. Andre Ribeiro is beginning to show how good he is here and how good this Tasman team is and the car they have put onto him because he seems to have a confidence level right now to dive down inside these star names and Michael is not that far up the road. to the inside again this time on Fangio. See how decisive that move is, Paul? Turned it right in. No ifs, buts, just straight down the inside. Oh, what a pleasure it is now for Rivera. We, we talked about the fun you have on an oval track. That's exactly what you see here. A confident driver with a fast car enjoying himself, making more passes than he has probably in the last couple of seasons. A pleasure when the car is fast and good. And that's what but it's not like Robbie Book Gordon's. It can be a very long day. An absolute nightmare it can be. Back to the front of the field. There is the leader, Michael Andretti. Now take a look up. We'll see where second place is. There he is, Ribeiro. As he flashes across the line, 3.3 seconds behind the leader, Jimmy Vassar, now trying to get out of traffic himself so he can, from third place, renew his attack on Ribeiro. Gary Gerald. Well, that spotter story is taking another little wrinkle here, if you will. Not only are there stands up there where you folks are at the top of the suites in the press box watching the front straightaway in the racetrack, we understand that Ribeiro had a spotter in turn two in a photo location. We we're informed by IndyCar officials that they're now escorting him from that location. So I guess he'll be looking for a grandstand ticket as well. <laughs> looking back to Al Unser, Jr., Still runs in six, and look at the traffic that he has to work with. And that is for a position. Teo Fabi behind him. Christian Fodipitopoli just ahead of him. Fabi looks to be the fastest car of this group here. But you mentioned that Christian can be very tough to pass. Well, look at Al Jr. Had to look to the outside. Now watch what Fabi does here. Stays down to the inside. Has a grandstand view of what might happen. Deferens right behind him. Here goes Junior. Allenser Jr. moves to the inside of Fittipaldi. Teo Fabi may not be able to get past. No, he can't. At the same time, up at the front, Ribeiro is closing on Michael Andretti. Now a second and a half behind. Barrett looking to the inside of Teo. And Jack Villeneuve, where he wanted to be. He's in the top ten. He's actually running ninth. Looking strong. Looking strong. Trying to pass to Farron. Still can't get it done. See the twitch on the front yeah. as he turned in there. That means the car may get away at any second. That tells the driver that's the limit. Don't go any further. Well, so for the young Canadian, it must be a frustrating day. He knows he can wrap up the championship. He knows because of that he has to be careful. But as a driver, he also knows you can be too careful. And he also knows that Frank Williams watches every move he makes, and Frank Williams likes him, and has already put his contract in his back pocket, so he's happy. Yeah, so no worries. Tail Bobby. And Alan Sir Jr. now working up through the field, trying to get Tracy. Fourth and fifth, Al Jr. likes the high side. He sets him up on the high side, vibration from the rear wing of Paul Tracy's car. This car that Paul Tracy's in has had so much understeer here all weekend. They tried a new aerodynamic tweak. They wouldn't tell me exactly what it was. They just said it did not work. They're on suspension number five on the front of this car, trying to get rid of some of the understeer that causes these drivers to have to come off the power and just go slower than they can go. 
Here's the running order after 64 laps. The real key is that number one position, Michael Andretti, because if he stays there, he's going to delay, if not ruin, any championship that Jack Villeneuve has in mind. Because it closes him into such a position that the championship would go on at least to the next race at Vancouver. All three previous winners here at New Hampshire have gone on to win the championship in the same year. Ray Hall in 92, Mansell in 93, Hunter Jr. last year. Look at this side by side with Ray Hall. One and a half laps. Ray Hall we thought was moving down to the inside. May Jr. worked so hard to go around the outside. Well, they have confidence in each other. They don't mind being side by side. It takes a full lap and a half to finally pull it off. why someone like Ray Hall just doesn't seem to be fast. If you have a push, you come off the power, you have no option to, but to let other people pass you. So Michael Andretti is the leader, but Andrew Ribeiro is closing in, and Jimmy Vassar runs in third. Jack Villeneuve and Jack finally gets around them. Interesting battle, considering it's well back for ninth place. Robbie Gordon in 10th, just behind. One minute, it's, he seems to tiptoe, and then suddenly he moves past somebody. Which is a, uh, an example of a driver measuring up the moves he can make. Remember, he has to think of the end of this race, so he has to think of championship and consistency, because if he makes a mistake here, then, of course, his championship chase becomes that much more difficult. Let's go back and look at it again. Jack and Jill. Now... Who was that, Paul? Jack and Jill. There they are. Remember well, Jill this. And Jack. This is together at 150 miles an hour. The slowest point they reach is 146. Now they're side by side. Speed increases. 185 miles an hour. They both turn into the left-hander. DeFerrin obviously doesn't want to make it easy. Oh, look at this here Whoa. with Gordon. Gordon, Fabi. Gordon has to pull high to let the rest of the battle through. Gordon got in deep trouble yeah, there. He got tight, so... Yeah. Get off to the now. Get back in your rhythm. You heard what Derek Walker said there. Get back in your rhythm. That was Gordon. Back to Derek Walker. Got Michael coming up behind you. He's about slot four. Michael behind you. So Robbie's complaining he's I loose. I think everybody else is too. Just everybody's caught up in traffic. Just hang in there. Don't give up an inch. I'm going a lap down. I'm going a lap down because I'm so loose, he says. We tried something the rear bar. Tried the weight jacker. Listening to Robbie Gordon as Derek Walker gives him some options. Got and Michael on your tail. Michael's going to fly by him here. This is going to be no trouble. Interesting that there goes Michael. <laughs> You're right. Frustration of a driver. Derek mentioned a weight jacker. Robbie Gordon inside the cockpit can jack weight onto the left front wheel, which actually makes the back more stable. Gordon says he's trying everything. Look at this. Look how easily Rivero just flies down the inside. But interesting the way the two-way radios pay off because it seemed obvious that Robbie hadn't tried that to its fullest extent until Derek reminded him. Sometimes you get so busy trying to hang on and save your life and keep the car off the wall, you don't have time to remember everything. Keeping an eye on Paul Tracy, Jack Villeneuve now runs in ninth place. Jan Vikas. Well, if you're wondering why he's so much more racy than he was earlier, he was another one of those guys, just like Robbie Gordon, that went loose. So when he made his pit stop, Barry Green says they took a ton of front wing out of it. He's much happier with the handling of that car now. Well, he's proving his performance. There's no question about that. The order, Michael and Ribeiro, 
1.2 seconds back. Then Vassar, Paul Tracy is fourth. Unser Jr. is fifth. You ride now with fourth place, Paul Tracy. Tracy doesn't quite make it. Vassar gets away. Tracy now forces the issue. Paul Tracy finally gets past Big Mo. Let's go to Gary. I'll tell you, he's happy right now for the first time. He says this car's really come into neutral. What they mean now, he's right at what they consider almost a perfect balance. That's what's made Tracy such a great contender the last two years in his dramatic battles with Nigel Mansell and Al Unser Jr. He loves the way this car's handling right now, and I think you're seeing it as you ride with him. Back on board with Paul Tracy. Jack Villeneuve just moved around tail Bobby. to the front, Michael Andretti, Andre Ribeiro. And look at Ribeiro. That's Teo Fabi, Paul. He's in trouble. He's a lap down now. Yeah, Jack just really screamed around him a moment ago. But look at Ribeiro. Ribeiro is now up to challenge. Superb race by Andre Ribeiro here. Oh, he's quick down the straights. He loves that inside line. Firestone tires on that Reynard versus the Goodyear tires on Michael's car. Good comparison of power here on the backside. Honda Ford Cosworth. Last lap speeds tell the tale of what might be inevitable here. It's Cheever and Foyt's car. Too slow, loose the high line. for the outside position. Remember, he tends to favor the inside, though. He does, but I think Rivero has the speed now over Michael. Now it's a case of trying to pick your spot. Paul Tracy's just moved around Jimmy Vassar for third. Mike, Tracy moving up, too. Michael will try and make it as difficult as he can because track position is so vital here if he can keep Rivero behind him. 49 laps since the last pit stop. Should be another 12, 13 laps before anybody's ready to head for the pits. Mateo Fabi, who has been having some problems, has headed for the pits early. Jan Vikas is right there. Paul, he's bringing it in because the car is very, very loose. So they're going to change the four tires, try and change the stagger on the car, and we're watching carefully. I'm surprised they're not going to change the front wings. No change on the front wings, just tires and fuel for Tail Fabi. Hopefully, just the stagger will be a big enough change. Somehow, I don't think so. Back up front. Michael Andretti still being pursued by Ribeiro. Paul Tracy now third place. He moved around Vassar. Plenty of traffic now lies ahead. And again here, Derek Daly, what you suggested at starting. Progression is a key, but who's going to have more of it in this battle? Well, it will be a proverbial traffic jam in about one more lap because Fittipaldi, Deferre, and Vilna are all in their own private battle, so they will not want to back off too much despite the leaders being right behind them. Ribeiro, Ribeiro's the man that's in uncharted territory here. He's learning on a huge learning curve today. about to be lapped as the leaders come up on him. But the real battle is right here. 
see Ribeiro change his line there. He went out. Oh, oh look at that. Him. Boy, right under breaking. Ribeiro almost had him, but then he gets caught up behind Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi lets Michael down to the inside. Now Ribeiro's caught up behind him. Ribeiro has to look for room, and Michael gets away. I don't know what that felt like in the cockpit, but that looked downright dangerous from where we are here. We're a long way away, but Ribeiro tried to make a move around the outside and almost got himself in deep trouble. Here he goes again. Ribeiro now comes up on the right rear, then looks to the inside. From excitement to terror to excitement, less than 20 seconds. He is so confident right now. The key is do not let the confidence override the power of the vehicle. Do not think this car can do more than it can do. Michael is so difficult to pass in a situation like this. And Michael knows the traffic. Well, Michael knows all you need to know on an oval track like this, but Rivero is in a faster car right now. Clear of that first bit of traffic that they had to deal with, but look at Rivero. Rivero now moves to the outside, gets very, very high, and he can't get it done. Whoa, remember, this is 150 miles an hour off these corners, and they are inches apart. There he goes. Rivero takes that line that he favors, ducks to the inside, takes the lead. At the same time, the black flag is going to come out for third place, Paul Tracy. They're seeing some smoke on the car, and they want to take a look at it. So third place will come out. Jimmy Vassar will come back to third. What a pass, though, by Ribeiro. What a move by Andre Ribeiro, the man who has so little experience in these conditions, leading races on an oval like this. What a great, spectacular afternoon he is having. He is brim full of confidence, and that car is brim full of speed. Let's move back to Paul Tracy now and keep an eye on his car. See if we can figure out why they may be giving him the black flag, what might be the problem as we pass the halfway point now. And here is Tracy answering that black flag, heading down into the Newman Haas pits all the way down at the far end. And Gary Gerald's there to watch. Gary, you have any idea what they're looking for? No, they know no more, or at least they've indicated no more than what we heard from the IndyCar officials, and then the fact that there was some smoke there. Boy, Tracy's hot. He did not like the fact that he was called in. They're taking the usual precautions of changing the rubber. And no, at the back of the car, the official is pointing, saying no. And at the front of the car, Tracy wants to go. An official won't let him, won't move. Tracy gestures desperately, but he is not going to go anywhere, according to these officials. At the back of the car, pointing emphatically, saying something back there. We're at the front of the car. Now the crew runs back to look as well. Then a Camphausen comes in. He shakes his head, waves his hand. No, you're not it's going over. anywhere. It's over for Tracy. And boy, this team and this driver is not happy. Well, let's stay with us, see exactly what it is. Ribeiro still running in the lead. We'll track him running in traffic. They're going to take the Colling off. The team doesn't want to give up on this yet. There's Ribeiro as he comes up to lap deck well now. Look at this in the cockpit. Look, Billy Camphausen and Tracy literally were nose to nose as Tracy had thrown the steering wheel. He grabbed at the hand of Camphausen, and there was an animated discussion. It may continue as Tracy's now out of the car. Boy, emotions running real high. And Billy Camphausen, of course, in the worst position of all, being the one who has to call that infraction. We yet do not know what the reason was to pull Tracy out. We should know in a few minutes. Paul Tracy absolutely livid, having had such a spectacular run all the way to third place with a car that he thought, and we thought, looked like was getting better as the race went on. And they come down, they take a look still at the back end, and we're still looking to try and determine exactly what the problem was. This was what gave Andre the lead of the race. And boy, look at how fast he just stuffed it down the inside and took the lead. We'll be back. Should be due for a pit stop any time now by this, the leader of the race, Andre Ribeiro. 69 laps since his last stop. Official reason now being given for Paul Tracy's being yanked out a third with the black flag is an oil leak, Gary Gerald. Well, here's Paul Tracy now, and he's had a chance to kind of collect his very angry. 
why I think it's a bogus call. They said, you know, they're saying we can't go back out and we can fix the problem, but they're saying they won't let us run. So I think that's a bogus call. It's eliminating us from the championship. I had a great race going. We need the points. It's right to the end of the year. I'm trying to trying to move up into the top three, and they won't let us return, which is disappointing. And what were you telling Billy Camphausen because you were almost literally right. nose to nose? I said, we got to get back out, and he says, no way. We're not letting you back out. So it's, I think it's a bogus maneuver on, the, on behalf of IndyCar to, to eliminate a guy when he's running in the top three position. Are you worried about disciplinary action because of that altercation? I could care less. You know, it's more important where we finish on the racetrack. Thank you, Paul. Angry. With some right to be. Third place. Well, there is safety still a concern. Yeah, there is so much at stake here. Millions of dollars go into putting these cars on the racetrack. And when you run in the top three, that is beginning to do your job as you want to do it. But there is an oil leak. Oil obviously was coming out onto the racetrack. I'm, I'm not quite sure why they can't fix it and maybe get back out again. But then we don't know exactly how serious it is. And, you know, there is a little bit of a comparative issue. Wide open road course, maybe you could have a little oil leak. Tight, bull ring oval. You don't want any spray on that racetrack. No chances because of safety. When you go through these corners with that white concrete wall on the outside, any slight bit of oversteer caused by fluid, you are in for a headache. In about two minutes, we ought to see Andre Ribeiro head for the pits along with the rest of the leaders at what this has managed to do is dropping Michael down into second place with Ribeiro's pass is once again impacts the way the points fight goes. For a while there, with Michael in the lead, the championship would go on to the next race at Vancouver, Canada. Right now, with Michael running in second place, if Jack can stay where he is or do better, he's currently running in sixth, then the championship will be his at the end of the day. Bill knew six contenders for the title have been mathematically eliminated. Two of his six. So, right now, he can stay there. You can see now that Michael is beginning to struggle to get by Bobby Rahal. We saw how easy he did it earlier. Well, he made it work for a little bit. Not quite as fast, and Rivero, who is putting on a superb display here of driving talent and the well set up racing car, which is absolutely running away from Michael. A little more on Paul Tracy. Gary, do we know yet what was leaking? Paul, I, I happened to get a chance to take a look underneath the rear wing as they brought the car back up on this side of the wall. It's very congested. They couldn't move it, and you could clearly see drops of oil coming off the whole lower stanchion. So apparently there was a very pronounced spray. It's definitely a lot of fluid. It appears to be oil, and uh, that's there's no question it was significant, at least in my, uh, my opinion. Well, Gary, while you're talking, we're watching Jeff Bildum as he really is carving his way up, just came up alongside and around Michael. That was not for position. Not for position. Not for position. For yes, he's back on the same lap now as Michael, but you can see Michael beginning to struggle. We can only presume his car has gone loose. The rear does not have enough grip. That is a problem here. These cars tend to go loose the more these races go on here on the Magic Mile at New Hampshire. Back 11 seconds in front now. Still Andre Ribeiro. And should be heading for the pits any time now. Right here. Andre Ribeiro is going to make his turn in. Will Michael Andretti turn in behind him? They're both 79 laps since their last stop. So here is Ribeiro. And Jan Vigas is watching. Andrew Ribeiro brings it to a stop. You saw the front brakes locked up there just briefly. Andrew Ribeiro is happy with the handling of the car but is having a few problems with the brakes. Maybe that's why we saw that one move when he had Michael, he went way high. So right now, they're just planning on changing the tires. There, all the fuel is in. Nice stop for him. We'll have to see if he hangs on to the lead, Paul. So Rivero at the 122nd lap, in and out. Has to be careful here. Don't want to get above those yellow lines, or you'll be right back in with a stop and go penalty. Again, the essence of the oval, safety is the key. You don't want to pull a car right out of the pits and right up into traffic. And Ribeiro, during that stop, never even lifted his visor. Didn't even want to get some cool, fresh oxygen. Was so happy with the position he was in. Good job by the Tasman crew. 
Boy, this is a great race. They will watch this videotape for a while. Second time he has led an IndyCar race was so impressive. At the 500 at Michigan, he led 68 laps here, the most by any driver that afternoon. And now he leads in convincing style here at New Hampshire. Well, on the stop, Michael Andretti and Jimmy Vassar were able to get a pa get past Ribeiro, but of course they're due to stop as well. Ribeiro becoming the first, along with Al Unser Jr. of those to make the second round of stops. And doing so on the 125th lap, the presumption is then that you go to the finish. And this package is so good, it's it seems to be unusual that Steve Horn would want to change to Lola cars for next year, but that's what he will do. He'll leave the Rainer, go to Lola, the same car that Michael Andretti is in here as we ride over his shoulder, still running in the lead because of Rivero's pit stop. Back in front, riding with Michael Andretti. Gilda Barron's pitted, Christian Fittipaldi has pitted, Jack Villeneuve has pitted, Robbie Gordon has made his stop. Emerson Fittipaldi made the stop, also did Mauricio Guzman. Gerald sits down in the Newman Haas pit as Michael comes to a stop. Well, we'll be watching the progress of Andre Ribeiro on the track as we watch the service job here from Newman Haas. Michael Andretti lost his teammate Paul Tracy a few moments ago. Ribeiro on the front straightaway. Tracy, I mean, uh, Andretti waiting. Now he makes his move. Will he get out in time? No, Ribeiro on the backside. Andretti comes up to speed. 13.9 seconds for the stop. And Michael brings her back up to speed. And Michael now has the fresh tires on, so the chase may begin to start again in the next 10 to 20 laps. Rivero at the moment is half a lap ahead of Michael, safely in the lead. And virtually everybody except Rivero and Andretti still have to make that stop in the top 10. We've had two caution periods for 11 laps here today. About a half a lap. So now the stops for the leaders complete, Jan Vikas. That's right. I can give you an update on a couple other stops, Paul. First of all, Jacques Villeneuve came in, made a very quick stop. No changes made on the car. Then right behind him, Gilles DeFerrin came in. His car must have been loose because it took a lot of front wing out of it. Also, Gilles DeFerrin has no clutch. Thankfully, we got him pushed and got him back out in the race. So after the stops, the order is Ribeiro, Michael Andretti, Unser Jr., Jimmy Vassar, and fifth place is Jack Villeneuve. And that's exactly where he needs to be to wrap up the championship right here in New Hampshire in the New England 200. Andre Ribeiro, the leader of the race by 11.3 seconds over Michael Andretti. Al Unser Jr. is third, then Jimmy Vassar, then Jack Villeneuve. In sixth now is Emerson Fittipaldi, then Christian Fittipaldi, Jill DeFerrin, Teo Fabi, and Robbie Gordon. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. In seven of the last eight races, Adrian Fernandez with a top ten finisher. Today it lasted less than a lap. First of all, you appear to be all right. Is that the case? Yeah, we're fine. It's, uh, we're really, uh, you know, disappointed about what happened. We don't know exactly what happened. I just lost it. Uh, coming out was really slow, and I just put the power and the car snap over soon. It's, uh, it's different from the accident I have in practice, but uh, it's a shame for the guys. The Gallus team has been doing a great job, and my sponsors, they got the Quaker State, but, you know, it's, uh, sometimes things happen, and we just have to learn to live with this. I mean, it's, it's not a good weekend for us. We just have to forget about it. Thanks so much, Adrian. Glad you're all right. Thank you. Boy, and while they were talking, you got an idea of why, as a leader, you can be sailing along, have all the speed, all the handling. Did you see him lock that front? Well, that was a bit too close for comfort. If Steve Horn sees this on the monitor, he will tell Rivero, back off a little bit. Watch this down inside the fern. Watch the front wheels. Boy, smoke just poured off the front there. She locks the brakes. Trying to get down inside Greco, who apparently didn't see him running in front of DeFerrin. Michael Andretti, second place. John Bikas, you've been watching Andre. That's right. We talked about the braking problem that he had. They feel as though the brakes are getting too hot. But also, Steve Horn radioed to him and said that when we took the Firestone tires off, that the right front tire was pretty well hammered. In other words, telling him to take a little bit easy on it, make sure he doesn't wear it out for the end of the race. 
here's the pit summary once again in and out. Penske team did some work for Unser Jr. See Team Green there did a great job for Villeneuve. The fastest of those pit stops gained him a position back on board. Robbie Gordon, Emerson Fittipaldi gained two positions. Eighth all the way up to sixth. But Robbie Gordon has a struggle on his hands today trying to manhandle this Valvoline Reynard. When it goes loose, you have to work all you can to get the best out of it. But sometimes all the changes you make, you still can't make headway. Gordon currently runs in 10. Leader is Rivera, then Michael. Here's third place, Al Unser Jr., just crossing the line. And once again, if he stays in position and nothing changes, we're going to be celebrating our first IndyCar champion here in New England. Back close enough to Canada, a lot of Canadian fans down here anticipating just that. A lot of Quebec license plates. Look here at Al Jr. People might ask, why do Penske struggle so much this year? Do you realize that in almost every single race this year, Penske cars are going faster than they did last year when they dominated so many races? But this particular car this year, they're having a tremendous amount of difficulty getting the balance right. Grant Newbury, their engineer, told me today they believe it's a mechanical imbalance somewhere in this car that hampers Al Jr. and Emerson, and they can't quite put their finger on the problem. Update on little Al, Jan Vegas. Well, from the handling side, we checked with the crew, and they said the car went a little bit loose in the mid portion of the race. But then he came in, made his final pit stop. At least they hope their final pit stop did not change the car. They're hoping just fresh tires will bring the car back to a balance for Al Jr. Running order after 143. Mauricio Guzman, he stayed out. There he is. 84 laps between pit stops. He had a great expression after Friday when he had difficulties with the car. He said, he said, obviously you can see we are out of the lunch today, but tonight, <laughs> tonight we work on the car and make things better. Ah, uh, you foreign guys. <laughs> of course, you know, they all year they've been trying to Americanize him, named him Big Mo. So at the front of the field, the nine second lead, Michael Andretti beginning to move in as Andre Ribeiro, Andretti is second, then Junior, then Vassar, then Villeneuve. Over New Hampshire International, Anheuser Busch's aerial ambassador, the Bud One Blimp. It travels to sporting events all across the country, providing beauty shots, and in the case of auto racing, some shots that can tell you intervals, what's going on, and how the crash has occurred. Ribeiro out in front. Michael Andretti second, then Unser Jr., then Jimmy Vassar, Jack Villeneuve. Nothing has changed while we've been away. And Jack Villeneuve, you see him there, the 27 car pulling up just behind Robbie Gordon. He is in a position to walk away from this race as the IndyCar champion. The New England 200, where it's now lap 152. And there's the running order of the top six. But the question that question that I would have, Ribeiro sits 10 seconds ahead of Michael Andretti. Gary Gerald, he's going to really be going a long way on the fuel tank that he has now. Can he make it to the end? We're just talking with that with the crew, Paul. This is the 200, New England 200, but that's a little misleading because remember this track is a little more than a mile long, 1.058 to be specific. Consequently, the race distance, 211 miles, and further of consequence, the pit windows have been narrowed for a two-stop race. Andre Ribeiro pitted on lap 121. He'd have to go 79 laps, and if it stays green all the way, there's a concern over fuel. So they've gone slightly to a fuel conservation mode. They would really like to have a yellow to take away any of that suspense. Jimmy Vassar runs in fifth, but Emerson Fittipaldi just got past him, and Vassar is beginning to fall backwards, so perhaps Vassar has a problem here. Running an average speed of 129.7 miles an hour, we have had two caution periods, one for Fernandez, one for Scott Pruitt. You've already heard from Fernandez. Scott Pruitt is okay as well. Hopefully we'll be hearing from him shortly. But the record here is Bobby Rahal set back in 1992 at 133.6, so at 129, we're beginning to close in on it. On board with 
Gordon. We watched out the window two laps earlier when Vassar got himself into all sorts of trouble on the way to turn three, went right up beside the wall, backed off, lost several positions, not from cars who were passing him for positions, but from lap cars. Now he gathers it up again. Clearly here, Gordon played with the throttle. He's on, off, on, off. That tells you he's trying to balance it. If the car handled well, he would get on in one long, smooth application of power. And that's always the indication of a confident driver that doesn't expect anything unusual to happen. Back to the pits, Gary Gerald. One of the concerns, Paul, for all of these drivers late in the race, if you get outside the groove, you get up into the gray, you pick up all of that loose rubber that's come off tires through the preceding laps. Drivers in the driver's meeting yesterday, several of them, including Robbie Gordon, Paul Tracy, very concerned about that because with the tire battle between Goodyear and Firestone, compounds have gotten softer, tires throw more debris up, and you get off the line and cost you. That was the problem for Jimmy Vassar just moments ago. He got in the gray, he picked up a lot of excess rubber, having a hard time scraping it off. It's impacted the handling of the car. Watching Jimmy Vassar, car 12, has fallen back to sixth now. Guzman just ahead of him, but Guzman, of course, running down in 14th, one of the lap cars. Right behind Vassar is Gordon. Emerson Fittipaldi, there he is, Jan Bikas. Well, we check with the Penske crew, and it turns out that Emerson Fittipaldi's race setup has been just about perfect. They haven't changed the car all day, and right now the Penske team is trying to get up from one lap down. They're actually radioing to Al Hunter Jr., giving him intervals, and they're going to try very, very hard here in the closing stages to catch Andre Rivero and get back on the lead lap. victory with 38 laps to go. Fuel will be part of it. Michael Andretti a second, 16 seconds back. The unusual combination of this season, a rookie driver, he was here last year in the Indy Lights series. He wasn't a winner, but a rookie driver in a Reynard car with a Honda engine and Firestone tires. Something that has never proven itself in the past to be successful. And Steve Horn has put this package together what a superb job this team has done. A new team back in IndyCar racing for Steve Horn. A lot of you will know him from his days at True Sports, and he was so successful with Bobby Rahal. And again next year, he wants to run an Indy Lights team as well as an IndyCar team. On board with Bobby Rahal, sits in 12th place. Guy who came in here with a chance at the championship. It seems to be going away now. The championship is right now firmly in the grasp of Jack Villeneuve. about that. As you know, Barry Green, Kim Green, Tony Sakali, the entire crew down here, they are so good at staying focused and keeping their driver and team members focused. That's what they're doing right now. He says that Jack is telling him that the car is good. It's not great. It's very, very slippery out there, and the slightest miscue that gets you off the primary groove can be disastrous. But as far as fuel and everything else, they're right on target. They like the way they've been moving consistently up. I think they'd be delighted. Well, we know they'd be delighted if they could get this thing over right now with two races to go, but they just don't really want to talk about that particular aspect. They're just trying to do the best job they can at the moment in these remaining 32 laps. Well, the possibility 
seems very real at the moment. Andre Rivero, Michael Andretti, two cars on the lead lap. Andretti 12 seconds back trying to close on Andre Rivero. Fuel may help decide this. Back at the New England 200, Loudon, New Hampshire, Andre Rivero out in front, Michael Andretti second. Nothing has changed in the order since we left you. Allinger Jr. is third, then Jack Villeneuve, Emerson Fittipaldi runs in fourth place. We'll give you a relationship here now. There is the leader of the race looking back for Michael Andretti as the leader flashes across the line, completing 173 laps and looking for Rivero. Seven seconds behind Andre Rivero. To give you an idea, Paul, of the difference in lap speeds, Andre Rivero was three miles an hour faster on the last lap than Michael Andretti. So he has this race well under control as long as he has enough fuel in that Honda car to go all the way to the checker flag. So 25 laps, a little over 25 miles to go. Michael Andretti still trying to run Andre Ribeiro down while Ribeiro is looking for his first ever win in the Indy cars. We'll be back for the conclusion of the New England 200. Back keeping an eye on Andre Ribeiro. We just ran a check of everybody up and down the pits. And the key players at the front, Andre, Michael, well, they don't seem to have any problem whatsoever with fuel. Not so sure the same situation is true at Penske Racing. Alan Sir Jr. runs in third place right now. He's 57 laps since his last stop. And Jack Villeneuve now sits in fourth place. And one factor that is going to affect the overall outcome of a championship and a possible wrap of it here today, as we suggested at the starting of the show, is where that appeal with Alan Sir Jr. over his win in Portland. Remember, he was disqualified and the win given to Jimmy Vassar. Well, if Al wins that appeal, then he'll come out of this race only 34 points behind Jack, and so the championship not yet determined, and that's based on little, little Al's position right now. So the championship can go on, and the appeal, well, it'll be some time yet before it will be heard. They're still putting the uh, panel of three appeals judges together. Seventeen to go for the Brazilian. Studied law for a while. Andre Ribeiro. Honda Power, Firestone Tires. Tasman looking for their first victory. Steve Horn, who was so prominent in bringing Bobby Rahal to championships. Stepped away from the Indy cars for a while. Got his feet under him as his own owner. Had success in Indy Lights. Now back up to the Indy cars. And look at the results. Went to Europe, Paul, to do the British Formula 3 championship with limited success. But he came up through the Indy Light Series. That's a good shot of his team manager, team owner, Steve Horn, on the radio to his young rookie who is learning so much this afternoon, leading this race in style. The only, the only thing he came here with was the Rookie of the Year honors from last year. What a superb job he's showing today. You got a view of him at the start, the uh, senior senator from Indiana, Dick Luger, former mayor of Indianapolis. Big racing fan, got to do something I've always wanted to do, watch from a starting stand at the, st at the start of the race. Has joined us up in the booth watching up here as we continue to watch Andre Ribeiro and Michael Andretti as Michael's still trying to reel him in, but it's not happening. Lap for lap as they get into traffic, Rivera goes faster, then Michael will match the speed, then suddenly Rivera pulls away again. But at the moment, we can only presume that Rivera is beginning to take things easy. We saw him shoot round the outside of Michael earlier in a very dangerous looking move, got away with it. We saw him lock his brakes inside Guzman. He got away with that. Sometimes you don't always get away with it three times. So he just needs to take things easy because he has all the tools this afternoon to win this New England 200. Nothing changes down through the order, though Fittipaldi is now beginning to close in a bit on Villeneuve. 
There you see Fittipaldi as the leader starting to close in. Fittipaldi just ahead of him in the blue and white car of Villeneuve, Villeneuve just ahead of that. The only thing that could change things, Paul, is a yellow flag. That would give Michael another opportunity possibly to pounce. However, the traffic would not be in, would, would not help him then because the leaders, we presume, would be at the head of the uh, head of the field. But one impressive thing, Paul, was how this Firestone car could duck down to the inside and get grip on that low line and speed as opposed to his his opposition. You know, the pass he made on Michael, that was spectacular when he just darted to the inside. You wouldn't think the car would stick under those kind of lateral G-forces. Boy, it sure did. Start at first, currently first. What a piece of videotape that will be when he gets to look at this race. We, of course, thought that Firestone must be under pressure to win here. Al Spire, their racing team manager, will tell you, no, they set a disciplined, conservative program for this season, and they have outshone their expectations, and the results that they got at Michigan, and they almost won the Indy 500, now they're in command here that is further down the road than they ever expected to be at this stage of their return season. And Ribeiro now running at a record pace. The record pace, 133.6 set by Ray Hall. And now Ribeiro with eight laps to go at 134.085. 22 of the 26 starters still running, Jan Vegas. Checking in with Al Unser Jr., of course, this has huge championship implications. Al Unser Jr. in his Penske machine feels as though they're very, very tight on fuel. Originally, he was trying to chase down Andrew Ribeiro to get the lap back. Now, he's really slowed off the pace, just trying to conserve fuel. Now, if anything happens, of course, that throws a whole wrench into the championship scenario. A championship scenario. Concern to all of us here today, normally in the booth, our scorer throughout all of these IndyCar races is Fran Leonard. Uh, he's rushed out of the track here yesterday. His son, Chad, who is quite an avid and successful go-kart racer, was injured in an accident yesterday in Michigan. He's in the hospital intensive care unit. We have a more promising report now that uh, he's improving, but our best wishes and prayers go out for Chad. Six to go, Ribeiro leads. Michael's closed a little bit, now 14.2 seconds. Michael closing, Ribeiro taking it easy. What do you think? Ribeiro controlling the race. I still believe from what we can see in the lines he can take, he has the power and the speed to challenge, even if Michael manages to get close enough. He is still almost half a lap behind Andre Ribeiro, and the traffic at the moment is beginning to fall Ribeiro's way. on the backside. Four to go. Notice the distinctive front wing on this Lola. They have tried three different front wings, three different rear wings on this car, trying to get the understeer, which is very prevalent during qualifying in particular, out of this Newman Haas Lola. They have yet to put their finger on the problem, and that's why Paul Tracy believes in race conditions on these over there, always better than they are when they try and qualify. Ford Cosworth power there in Michael's car, but we're looking at the potential of history being made up in the front. Honda Power looking at their potential first IndyCar win. Remember, so very close at Indy with Scott Goodyear. Now three to go for Honda. Andre Ribeiro and Tasman first for everybody there. You mentioned Honda Power. Will the Newman Haas cars be powered by Honda engines next year? There have been meetings, there have been discussions, and Carl Haas knows a good engine when he sees one. We've got a crash. Buddy Lazier. Lazier catches the wall, turn four. And will they get it cleaned in time? Marco Greco down on the inside. Now Steve Horn talks to Ribeiro as the white flag will come out, so that won't change anything. Ribeiro will see the white flag, and unfortunately, he'll see the checkered flag under yellow. His first win will come under a yellow, but still a well-deserved victory. As Ribeiro now taking a look at the white flag as he gets through the accident zone and down the front stretch. There are two cars involved. Buddy Lazier is one of them. He made hard contact with the outside wall. That's in Dale Coyne's car. There is also one of the Pac West cars involved in that, I believe. 
Is it Guzman? Now Guzman appears to be in the line, as does Fangio. Greco is the Marco one that we thought. There's the checkered flag. Checkered flag for Andre Ribeiro, for Honda, for Tasman. Great victory here today, right from the pole. Ribeiro takes the victory as the yellow comes out on the final lap. And Andre Ribeiro has taken the victory. Oh, what a nice win. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Steve and Christine Horn, I know the emotion must be huge at this moment. What are the feelings? Well, we've had a couple of get away from us this year at Indy and at Michigan, and I think uh, this is a great credit to Andre. He drove a fantastic job, and uh, I just got to say a very special thanks to Honda in particular and to Firestone for giving us the product. Guys on the team never, never gave up. So many people were skeptical. They said a rookie had no chance in a bull ring like this to win. Did you give him much of a chance? I gave him a lot of chance because uh, he did a great job in lights, and this is the next step for him, and uh, this is great. Well, get out there and enjoy it. <laughs> They'll come off the wall, and we'll head with the crew as we get down there to get a word with Andre Ribeiro. Do you think, Paul, he knows where Victory Circle is? <laughs> I think we'll have plenty of people down there to point him to it. Boy, is he a happy guy, too. This will be a popular victory, too. He's so well-spoken, enjoys life, enjoys racing so much. Yeah, Buddy Lazare, he's out of the car. He's obviously okay. We'll check on Marco Greco, too, down on the inside. He looked to be all right. Look at this. I love to see this celebrations when a rookie driver gets to take his first win in unusual circumstances because it really was the unexpected, but that gives Firestone two wins in the last three races. Third win from the pole this year, Gordon, Detroit, Villeneuve at Elkhart Lake. Let's go to Gary. Yeah, it's chaos, as you might well expect. We're trying to get, here's Andre right here. He sits down on the side pod. Christine Horn has just gotten here. And we'll try to get that helmet off. And, uh, and we'll hear the first words that come out of this young Brazilian's mouth. I don't know. I think it might be a howl or a scream of delight or something. But Andre, he gets the breathe right strip off the nose, the earplugs. What's the emotion of this moment, young man? So many people said there's no way a rookie can win at this racetrack. You've just done it, and you've done it convincingly. Well, I can't believe this is the greatest moment in my life. It's, uh, it's incredible. It's right. incredible. What were your concerns when this day started? What were you trying to remember as the key that might get you to this moment? To be patient. Very, very, very patient. Uh, I was talking with Steve Horn all the time on the radio. They were keeping me cool. But I tell you, the last laps were difficult. It's great. Great. How tough was it with the last lap when you saw the yellow? There was an incident there. Was that the realization then? This thing is one. You knew that it was only a lap or two to go. Well, I really tried to wait for the last, for the last lap. Uh, really, the checkered flag because I knew the the race only would finish on the checkered flag. But it's an incredible moment. It's great. He's got the Brazilian flag in his hand. He wipes away the tears. He displays it. We now have nine different winners this season, Paul. So Andre Ribeiro takes the victory here over Michael Andretti. The championship still goes on while we wait the results of an appeal and, of course, the actions of Al Unser Jr. on the race course. There's still plenty to talk about here in the New England 200, but congratulations. There's the unofficial results. Andre Ribeiro on his first win. Definitely underway for Andre Ribeiro. What about second place, Jan Vikas, Michael Andretti? Well, of course, Mike Landretti normally would be pretty excited about running second place and running a competitive race, but where did Andre have the speed on you? Was it the tires? Was it the Honda power plant? Where do you think he pulled out the distance? Uh, I think he had, uh, I think Firestone did a pretty good job this weekend with their tire, and he had a lot of grip, especially in traffic, and, uh, you know, my car was quite good, actually. I was pretty happy with it, but, uh, you know, that was the difference, I think. Now, tell us about the championship. This pretty much eliminates you from a championship hunt to go to the front with Jack finishing fourth, but uh, still some good, exciting racing to come. Oh, yeah, no question about it. I mean, uh, we'll just try to finish on a high note and get him next year. You know, we still want to go after second place, and, uh, you know, that's still gettable. We enjoyed watching today. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, here's Al Unser Jr. from 17th to finish third. That itself is pretty remarkable around this place, but the thing that we want to ask you about is your impressions that relate to the championship because the appeal leaves everything up in the air. If you win that appeal, you're still mathematically alive. 
Yeah, we just, uh, you know, we just don't know. It's, it's something that uh, I just want to congratulate Ribeiro. He did a great job all day long, and, and uh, you know, the Honda ran great for him. But uh, uh, my whole Marlboro team, Penske, did a super job. My guys, they got me in and out of the pit so quick. We passed, like, about five or six guys on that first stop. And so, uh, you know, without them, it was really great. And, uh, and I just, you know, want to want to say hi to Al, Cody, and Shannon at home, and uh, we'll be home later on. As you congratulate Andre Ribeiro, did you think coming into this weekend that a rookie could win a race in this bullring? Well, I tell you what, the, the PPG IndyCar World Series is so competitive this year that, that just about any of the top 15 can win the race, and, and, uh, and so a rookie here, you know, you kind of think <laughs> not, but... Uh, but their whole team did a great job, and they deserve the win. And you did a great job coming from 17th. Congratulations on this third-place finish. Thanks, Gary. Paul? So still plenty else to take a look at. Look at the partisan crowd for Brazil and this Brazilian win. I'll tell you, the flags came out here at the start-finish line. Look at that. They love their racing, and they love this victory. So here in Loudoun at New Hampshire International, a first-time win, a run from the pole for the victory for Andre Ribeiro. Still more to talk about, more to do here as the championship fight, in fact, does continue. We'll be back. Above, now below, it's quiet on this bull ring at New Hampshire International, and history has been made. That young man, Andre Ribeiro, has taken the victory. The championship fight, well, it goes on, Gary Gerald. And here's the man who's involved in it, of course, the smile on his face, a tough day's work. Your worst qualifying after the year, Jack, starting 15th, you end up fourth, and you take a huge, huge step now to clinching the championship. So I would think you and this team have got to be very proud. Oh, we're very happy. You know, it was a great effort from everybody in Team Green, uh, starting where we were. Uh, it wasn't looking great for the race, but uh, we knew we'd, we'd have to go in there and, and be aggressive. And uh, uh, on, on the first set of tires, after 10, 15 laps, the rear started to slide quite a lot. But we're always running in the gearbox of someone, so we're using the tires a lot. But after that, we made a few changes, and, and the car was really strong for the end of the race. We were just talking with Al Unser Jr. about his title hopes, and of course it all hinges on the appeal that is still pending. How much does that appeal enter into your thinking and the thinking of Team Green? Well, in a way, it's, it's annoying to think that, you know, points can be given, be given back, and then that would change the whole championship. Uh, you know, it's, that thing happened a long time ago, and it's, it's funny that, that, you know, it might still change. But uh, if it changes, uh, you know, mathematically, it's still possible that Al gets it, so uh, we're not going to stop fighting till the end. Well, congratulations on your drive today, and thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Paul? So, Jack Milnev, as he continues his battle in the championship, again, the unofficial results will look through the full order for you, but there was no question about that victory by Ribeiro. He was well ahead, 14.48 seconds, the margin of victory. Down through Jimmy Vassar, as we'll take a look at all of the unofficial results, and then we'll take a look at the points for you after we get done looking here. And the points fight now affected by that appeal hearing for Al Unser Jr.'s performance at Portland. And that will be heard by three judges. So when we take a look at the points here, 168 to 114, but the key is down there with Al Unser Jr. Because if he picks up some more points, he jumps up to 132 if they give him his win back. So. That's what we're watching and what we're waiting to see. When we come back, we'll take a look at some highlights of the day here in the New England 200, one that saw history made for Ribeiro and Honda. As a result of today, the win by Brazil tightens up their position in third in the Nations Cup battle right now with the United States still out in front. There's the Manufacturers Championship, Honda getting a handful of points here. Coming up next, the 22nd annual Big League Softball World Series Championship. I'll tell you what, it is terrific. Don't miss it from Tampa, Florida. By the way, Scott Pruitt, we didn't get to interview him. That's because they're still going to have him rest a little bit, but it appears that he is okay. Some highlights of the day as we say goodbye to you from Loudoun, New Hampshire, and the New England 200.